This should be, I should have had my Facebook ready to go. All right, welcome to our, another evening of our Gifted Parent Seminars. This evening, we are learning more about our latest middle school gifted program called Journey. And so we are here with the teachers and the principal at the, the new school, Mountain Trails Middle School, for this program. And this uh, presentation is a collaboration between the United Parent Council and the gifted program. And Janine, I'll let you switch slides there for me. We've got several things coming up this month and next month. We're continuing with our presentations of some of these specialty programs with um, Wednesday's um, presentation of Digital Academy Advanced Placement Scholars at Shadow Mountain High School. And uh, then we'll have Monday the 19th, we're gonna have the NVAA or North Valley Arts Academies program. We then will come back to our gifted early childhood programs on November 17th. Then the United Parent Council programs that we've got coming up this month, we have our education or how to be an education voter. And next month we dive into all the many PD school signature programs. So we hope you'll join us for one or more of those events. We do seem to be getting more people on here uh, on the uh, Zoom presentation. If you'll switch to the next stream, we're just gonna go over a few house housekeeping rules because we are recording this event. It is being recorded on our Facebook Live and then we will add it to our YouTube uh, program. So we are asking that you not have your videos on during the presentation so we can focus on the presenters. Um, and all of your microphones are set to off. We will be doing question and answers. So please feel free to post questions in the chat both on Facebook and in the Zoom presentation, and we will be asking those questions. If you would, please try to keep those as generic questions because this is being recorded. All right, and now I have the pleasure to introduce Patrick Clancy, who's the principal at our Mountain Trails Middle School. Patrick. Thanks, Melissa. I'm Patrick Clancy. I'm the principal at Mount Trail Middle School, uh, the new principal at Mount Trail. This is my first year actually returning to Mount Trail, my first year as the principal here at Mount Trail, but when the school opened well back in uh, 2002, 2003 school year, I was actually a teacher uh, at Mount Trail for the first four years that we were open. Uh, and then beyond that, I went into administration uh, primarily at the middle level in PV uh, and uh, spent the last four years at the district office as one of our directors in PV uh, before requesting the opportunity to return to Mountain Trail. Uh, and, and I was placed here last spring to start the 2021 school year. Little did I know at the time that it was going to be perhaps the most unique school year in the history of education, <laughs> certainly at least in my time, in my timeline, uh, in my lifetime. But uh, it, ha it has been a pleasure. And, and what I would like to do is just take a couple of minutes uh, to share a little bit about Mountain Trail Middle School in general uh, before passing it over to Janine Ryan Franson and Ted Theodoro, the uh, developers, the brain children of uh, the facilitators of the, the journey program here at Mount Trail. Uh, and certainly uh, they are much more important uh, for our purposes tonight uh, to share the information specific to journey. But we do know that um, it, is very scary for uh, sixth grade families to send their kids off from the safety net of K-6 to this wild, uncontrollable, scary 7-8 uh, middle school time frame, specifically for those, those families uh, who have never sent a child off to middle school before. So if this is your first child and you're trying to find a, um, the right fit for your family, hopefully we can, we can play a role in that. But let me just kind of first lead off by saying uh, middle school is awesome. Uh, middle school can be, middle school should be. Uh, it is our jobs to ensure that middle school is the two most enjoyable and significant years in your children's lives and their educational careers. Uh, we would be the wrong people to be at the middle level if we didn't believe that. And 
Uh, this is my 23rd year in education. I can assure you that it is possible to create that scenario for their kids where it's the most impactful two years of all of their time in K-12. And so that's what we're, we're working towards here at Mountain Trail. Uh, it doesn't matter to some degree if Journey is the absolute right fit for your child if we can't create a school in general that is the right fit for them over the course of the entirety of the day. So again, I just want to take a couple of minutes to share a little bit about uh, what we have here, what we're working towards here at Mountain Trail. Uh, the oddity in this kind of a format is um, I'm new uh, and uh, you know I, I, I'm probably transparent and honest to a fault. And we have had the entirety of our staff on campus now for seven days. We've had our seventh graders for three and a half days, and we've now had our eighth graders on campus for a day and a half. And so I can't sit here in full transparency and, honestly, and honesty and, and express to you exactly uh, what I believe is our starting point right now. I truly don't know. Uh, I've spent the better part of the last five, six months um, digging in deep every day, trying to figure that out. And I've learned a ton and I continue to learn a ton all the time. Um, but truth be told, I still have a lot more to learn about our school community and exactly where we're at right now. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is kind of tell you where I do know some things. Uh, where I don't know some things, I do know some things. I know exactly where we're headed. Uh, I don't know how close we are to get there yet. I sense we're close. Uh, I also sense we have a little bit more work to do. Uh, and I do know that the Journey program is in exceptionally good hands uh, with Mrs. Ryan Franson and Mr. Theodoro. Uh, the program is off and running. And so they're going to share a little bit more about the program with you. Uh, let me tell you uh, where we're headed in terms of a school in general. Uh, our kids are amazing. Um, our kids are amazing. And, and specifically the kids in, uh, in, in the Journey program. Uh, which you're most interested in tonight, uh, we incorporated them into this presentation uh, because they will be able to give you more information that's beneficial to you than we could as adults. Uh, they are the ones, the kids in our school are driving our school community. Um, and, and, and as are the child advocates, the adults that we have on campus. In, in everything we do, uh, every day, everything that we will do is intentional, it's strategic, uh, and it's because we know that our kids come to us with some very unique needs. Uh, over the next two years, between seventh and eighth grade, our kids will um, grow more socially, emotionally, academically, and physically than they likely will at any other times of their lives, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, and, and here's an example just on the social-emotional side. Um, our kids come to us from K-6 where they have to some degree, at least some of them, uh, grown up with the same group of friends that they've had since they were five years old. And they, they grow up largely if they stayed in the same school from kindergarten through sixth grade, they've largely had the same friend group uh, and spent almost the entirety of their time with this same group of kids. But then they come to Mountain Trail and we have a total of 600 kids in our campus this year. And they're exposed to kids from multiple Feeders. And in, in doing that, they're exposed to kids who they might have more in common with, they might connect with, they're going to develop new friendships, we're going to encourage them to develop new friendships and try new things. What we know, uh, with all kids, but, but in particular, uh, with seventh grade girls, that within that first semester of school, um, they're going to, in developing new friendships, uh, unfortunately, some of their older friendships uh, with people that they may not have as much in common with anymore, um, some of those old friendships are going to dissolve. And it hurts. Uh, it will feel like a divorce to them. It's devastating. Uh, and they don't have the emotional capacity yet to process through all of the emotions that they're going to feel when some of those friendships start to dissolve. When that happens with middle level kids, um, sometimes um, actions and words come out uh, that make the scenario harder or worse and not better. Well, we know that's going to happen. Uh, we are experts at, at the middle level child and their, and their level of their stage of development. 
And so we better be prepared to help nurture them through those things because everything that to them at this stage in their development, those things are so much more important to them sometimes than the lesson that they're learning in ELA or in science or social studies or math that day. And so we need to be prepared to support the entirety of the child. So the way that we do that is that we make sure that there are teachers on this campus that are um, flat out, that just flat out are all in for kids, that they will do whatever it takes in, 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 in every classroom, from one class to the next, from one department to the next, to ensure that our kids are taken care of. You combine that with uh, learning activities that are fun and engaging and rigorous and challenging, not just drill and kill and not just worksheets, uh, but, but true project-based learning uh, that Janine and Ted will walk you through in the journey program tonight um, that, that can, in combination with knowing and loving and supporting and nurturing our kids, and then also exposing them to rigorous, enjoyable, challenging curriculum uh, that's based in passion and, and facilitated, facilitated by a passionate uh, middle-level child advocate. When those two things come together, what we have is a school community of adults and kids that will run through walls to do whatever it takes to create um, a, a, a supportive nurturing environment every day. So that's where we're headed. Again, uh, how close we are to being there right now, I'm not exactly sure. It's gonna take me a little bit more time to figure it out. Uh, again, I sense that we're close. Uh, I also sense that we have a little work to do. And so uh, what I also know, in addition to where we're headed, what I also know is that uh, Janine and Ted have already created a amazing, uh, supportive, nurturing, loving, challenging, rigorous, interesting, engaging, passionate place for our gifted learners to come each day and to be able to be accepted as a unique learner and human being uh, in, in the journey program. And so uh, rather than continuing to rattle on and, 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 and share a little bit more uh, about Mount, Tra Mount Trail in general, what I'd love to do is pass it along to Janine and Ted uh, to, to get into the presentation and talk specifically about the journey program. Thank you so much, Mr. Clancy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, we are so excited to, to share the journey program with you this evening. We're going to start with a little uh, video. Welcome this evening. We're so excited to talk to you about our journey program. Um, I'm, my name is Janine Ryan Franson, and um, I guess I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, this is my 20th year of teaching. Um, I absolutely love it. And this is a um, wonderful program to celebrate um, my career in education. I, I have earned a master's degree in curriculum and instruction from NAU and my bachelor's degree from ASU. Um, I have three, three amazing boys. My oldest is, at, um, is a sophomore at ASU, and um, I've been, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. Um, it's been 22 years, and um, I just absolutely love what I do, and um, I really am having a, a wonderful time with our students um, this year. So I'm just very excited to share with you this evening about everything we are, are doing with kids. Um, and next up is Mr. Theodoro. 
Thank you, Mr. Ryan Franson. It's great to be here. Thank you uh, for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm Mr. Theodoro, and I'll introduce, uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, this is my second year in Paradise Valley Schools, my 10th year teaching overall. I grew up in Tucson, but I've been gone from the desert for a little bit. Um, I started my career out on the East Coast in Fairfax County Public Schools, uh, which fun fact is the 10th largest school district in the country. So I had a very, uh, had access to all the Smithsonian's and all the awesome museums in the Washington DC area. So definitely uh, good to be home, good to be back near family, um, but definitely miss the uh, culture and excitement of the East Coast. I do have endorsements in several areas as well. I'm endorsed to teach language arts, science, social studies, and gifted students. My academic background is a bachelor's in political science and classics from U of A, go Wildcats. And I guess I should show you that this program is a testament to the fact that uh, Sun Devils and Wildcats can work together. Janine and I have been doing just fine. Um, I also have a master's in theological studies from Holy Cross uh, School of Theology in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I then decided I wanted to go on into education. So I did a master's of curriculum and instruction from Radford University in Southwest Virginia. And when I moved to the DC suburbs, I then did a um, graduate certificate in education and leadership. Uh, a little bit about my family. You can see a picture there I, of my three boys. I also have three sons, um, just like Janine. They are Andreas, ages five, Nico is two, and little Jack is six months old. Um, it's been going through a lot these last six months. So uh, thank you for all of your positive wishes and vibes. My wife there is also a, a teacher here in Paradise Valley. She teaches second grade at Camp Labella. And I just put a little uh, bubble there that says that my, and we'll talk about this a lot later, but my teaching philosophy is based on 21st century skills um, where we're fostering communication, collaboration, resiliency, creativity, critical thinking, and global citizenship. And it's been said many times, um, but it's, it's very true for me that I, I see myself as a guide on the side rather than a sage on the stage. And I think that that's why being at a place like Journey is such a perfect fit for me. So we look forward to uh, going through this with you. All right, thank you, Mr. Theodora. We are gonna um, kind of go through our program design first, and then we'll be sharing some student work with you and, and some, some fun um, little excerpts of, of what, they, what they feel about the program. So um, our program design is based, uh, um, our program is based on flexibility and meeting the specific needs of our students. We have, um, a blended learning um, environment, so that is, is rigorous, but then also provides a lot of choice for our students to demonstrate um, their, their learning in many different ways based on their, their learning, um, their, I, I guess just based on their learning styles because every student is, is a little bit different. So, and we are coaches and facilitators and we um, just, we have, very um, wonderful students and we are able to um, just work with them in many different ways. And you can see in the diagram here, there's um, some times the students are working collaboratively, sometimes they're in, in small groups, sometimes individually. And so it um, depends on the project and what we are studying. All right, and so we do have this blended learning environment and some of the positives with this is that it, it does create a flexible learning environment. Um, we collaborate with our students to design um, learning that is personalized to them. And that is a big part of the journey program is it's personalized based on our students and their interests. Um, and that'll really, I think, shine through when you see some of their work that they, they've they've been um, completing recently. So um, a big por um, part of our program is that we really want to give quality feedback to our students and develop goals alongside them, with them. Um, they take a very active role in, in doing that with us. Um, we use evidence-based um, 
projects and practices. Um, that, and again, just everything is very much rooted in student interest because that motivation is very, very important. Um, so the students, um, you know, of course, master all of the standards, um, will be very well prepared for high school and organize, um, and develop a lot of executive function and organizational skills along the way. All right. So um, some of the benefits of blended learning, it, um, it students will retain um, the information better because they're motivated, they're excited about the way that they get to prove their, or show their understanding. So um, it, and that helps with student confidence and, and of course in student engagement. So there's some additional benefits um, that have been documented of blended learning. And I should say it just at the beginning before I even go into these, um, that one of the benefits that's not on here that we, that we should speak to is that blended learning goes very well with our current um, situation in this COVID world that we're living in. Um, whether we are, whether we find ourselves in a synchronous environment or an asynchronous environment, teaching all in person or all online or some in person or some online, um, the nature of a journey, as Ms. Franklin has said, is that it, it meets students wherever they are at. And it is very accommodating to, I think, whatever situation uh, we find ourselves in, in the world. So with that being said, um, some of the other benefits that have been documented um, is that students have greater autonomy. And again, by developing their self-awareness and their goal setting, that develops a lot of maturity and, and personal growth. It instills a sense of self-advocacy and ownership of their education. And lastly, it promotes their self-drive, responsibility, and tracking of individual achievements. You know, if I could tell a quick story, um, even before I worked at Journey, I knew I wanted to be at a place like this. When I had a student, I think the assignment was to create a poster of something. It was just a standard poster uh, assignment for everybody, create a visual display. And I had a young man tell me that he was not interested. He flat out told me, he said, Mr. Theodoro, Mr. T, that's what they call me, Mr. T, um, I don't want to do this. And I said, well, you know, this is, this is part of your grade. You really do need to uh, consider it. And he said, well, I don't want to do it. He said, I don't want to make a poster, but I can code something for you. And I remember thinking, well, all right, let me give him a chance. And sure enough, um, I forget what it was about the electoral college or something in civics. And within a week, he had this amazing digital animation of how the electoral college worked. And it just made me think, um, wow, this is really um, uh, uh, powerful is how he knew how to advocate for himself. He knew how to say, you know what? I know what my strengths are. I know what I need to do uh, to show you that I know this. And it ended up being a really killer, awesome presentation. We're gonna talk more about uh, choice and everything later, but when I see up there that second bullet point about instilling a self of self-advocacy, that's something that I hope, I think that we Hope that all of our students will will develop that that um, desire to speak up and to show us how they learn best and how they can demonstrate their knowledge in, a, in the best way. Right. So, and I agree with Mr. Theodoro. Um, providing that choice is just so motivational for our students. Um, our our students here that, that thrive at the Journey program are self-directed learners. Um, they're self-motivated and they are students who, who embrace that project-based and problem-based learning. Um, and so we believe in our students, you know, and we, we, we truly communicate with them and listen to them and um, they they come through, you know, and the things that they can create are incredible and it's really exciting and we've just begun. All right, so some of our, um, as Mr. Clancy had mentioned, you know, having the voice come from the students is, is the most important thing. So um, we asked our students today, I gave them a few sentence starters. I said, okay, I'm, I just would like to hear what you have to, what you think of the program. And so, so this is what they said. Okay. 
I applied to the Journey program because I wanted a better hands-on learning experience and a better challenge. I applied to the Journey program because I needed a challenge in learning. Mountain Trail Middle School is like a tight-knit community. We're like a family, too. This year, I am looking forward to making creative projects. The Journey teachers at Mountain Trail are very kind and understanding. And they're good at creating a safe and happy learning environment. They're flexible and they're the best teachers we could ask for. I would recommend the Journey program to other gifted learners because Journey is very fun and you can meet new pe people. And instead of lectures, it's project-based learning. My favorite part about the Journey program is that the class sizes are smaller and the teacher has more time to focus on your individual learning needs. Where will the Journey take you? All right, very cool to see those uh, voices. So we're just gonna go through a couple of our overall objectives for the program. Again, kind of uh, stating what our vision is and what we hope to build as the program continues to grow and grow. And the first major objective that really is at um, the heart of our program is differentiation. We really want to provide an experience that's based on the social, emotional, and academic needs of our gifted learners. And I really want to just draw this attention to this, to this image here. And I know that this is very uh, thought provoking for a lot of people and can stir up a lot of, you know, maybe emotions, but it really does, I think, get to, like I said, the heart of, of what we're all about. You know, equality is very different than equity. And it's something that we ask our students to reflect on too. And then as we, you know, we know and believe as educators, um, sometimes giving people, treating people the same you know, it sounds good, but it's not always fair. And as we see on the image on the left, you know, giving everybody the same thing, especially when it comes to instruction, still leaves some people out of the loop. In this case, it's not being able to see a baseball game. Um, but in our case, in the education world, it means that some people still aren't able to access the, the curriculum. So rather than providing an equal experience, we're all about providing an equitable experience, meaning giving students what they need to access the curriculum. Um, in the same way that we would tell somebody that they couldn't use their glasses or contacts if they needed glasses or contacts, we're not gonna, if somebody needs to show again, they're learning in a certain way, our job is to find what they need and to differentiate for them uh, in that way. Absolutely. And so that is what journey is really all about is it's personalized. Um, that is our, our goal, you know, is to get to know our students, to see what they need to work on, um, but embed that into projects that um, help them um, to grow and that they're motivated by. You know, we just really want, want our students to, um, to excel. And so we do develop those goals with our students and personalize what we do with them. So another uh, major objective for us is what, we, what we're calling interdisciplinary connections. Um, you know, we work in these different blocks of different content areas. Um, Ms. Ryan Franson takes uh, science and social studies, and I do language arts and social studies. And together, by combining all of those together, we're able to um, make those connections between subjects. You know, we believe, we know that kids don't learn best or people don't learn best when they're learning things in isolation. Um, but by creating a holistic experience, by creating a bigger picture lens, um, by focusing on concepts um, and ideas, as opposed to just facts and kernels of, you know, pieces of information, that is what allows them to uh, actually get up on that higher level of thinking and provide that rigor that many of our gifted students um, so badly need. In our first quarter uh, interdisciplinary connection, it actually came together, I think, very beautifully. We were very both pleased with how it came out, uh, was focusing on culture, community, and identity. And again, we look forward to showing you some of that in just a few minutes.
Oh, sorry. Um, so the next uh, objective is also about constructivism. And this is um, kind of what I, when I, when I mentioned in my intro slide there about our um, teaching philosophy, but going along with, you know, we construct knowledge for ourselves. And if you look on this image, um, there's a lot of research that shows we only remember, I think it's something like 20, 30% of the things that we, that we hear. And we only remember another 10% of the things that we see. But as we go up and up and up along this uh, Bloom's taxonomy and this higher level thinking, we remember things best and we actually, real learning takes place when we are operating at those higher levels, when we are creating things, when we are evaluating things, when we're determining the value of something or when we're analyzing. You know, one of the big things we do in our social studies curriculum is DBQs, document-based questions. And when we're evaluating and analyzing evidence, that's when that real light bulbs go on. So again, when we, it's not to say that there's not a place for those lower level uh, recognition and recalling of facts and understanding what those facts mean. But as we start to move up, when we apply them, when we analyze them, when we evaluate and we create, that is where we're trying to get our students to operate uh, a majority of the time is at that higher level. And providing that personalized um, instruction and choice um, is is really part of how how we can get there with our students. Um, we give them specific feedback. Um, this is definitely a rigorous program um, where you know we identify goals with our students and give them very specific feedback. And our our class sizes are are amazing and allow us allow us to do that. Um, we use rubrics um, extensively, and that helps students to understand um, what what the how to refine their learning and how how to, what specifically they need to be able to do. Um, so again, as we mentioned, um, that goal setting with us is really important. One of the neatest things um, that as a teacher is to watch students um, with their metacognitive um, growth over the, over the years. And so it's really neat when you see the, the kids developing those, those skills where they're really thinking about, about their, how they learn. And that's how we can really work with our students to prepare them for what's to come in, in their future in whatever endeavor they'd like to be um, pursuing. Um, a big emphasis for that. A lot of our students are have um, asynchronous development and um, as gifted learners. And so we're um, quite often working with students to help improve their executive function and organization. Um, and so those are some of the things that having um, projects and a lot of, of choice, it, it, you know, they're motivated with, with something exciting that they're working on. And so it really helps them um, to, to with their organization and thinking about how they learn. Um, and uh, along with this, some other of our ob objectives here are that, um, you know, we're working in small groups or individually. Um, depending on what, what the project is that we're working on um, and identifying, you know, there, again, those tar learning targets, strengths and interests. Um, and, you know, they, they're given choices about how, um, how they're going to demonstrate what they have learned. Um, it, again, it's still, still quite rigorous. However, it's also fun, you know, and that's what learning should be. So they they get to demonstrate their knowledge in a, in a way that they find motivational. Um, some of the things that we do, we have videos, web quests, research projects, choice boards, um, art, we'll use textbooks and, and things, but um, I can't wait to show you all the things that we've already done. And here we are. Um, so we, um, again, as Mr. Theodora had mentioned, our first quarter really, um, it just, it, it ended up being a, really about our culture and our community and our identity and our social studies and our science and language arts all kind of integrated nicely together. Um, so I'm gonna show you um, some, some of our student work. Um, 
the first we learned from um, I, the students were given a quote um, from Ruth Bader um, Ginsburg and they were really given an, a choice of what they, how they wanted to um, relate to this quote. And you'll see that our students are so, so different and they're passionate about different things. And so they were given this rubric um, and the students then were, um, came up with quite diverse um, projects. Excuse me. My RBG project represents the diverse cultures that make up America, from the Native Americans with their vast and beautiful traditions to the centuries old creativity of the Hispanic people, the Jewish people who have built a tight knit and loving community, even when the world isn't quite as loving towards them, the LGBTQ plus community who are persistent with their constant fight against oppression and hate, and last but certainly not least the strong and fearless black people of our country. That is the culture of America. That's what makes us unique. We are definitely on the road to acceptance, but we still have miles ahead of us. So many of our students have that, so, that interest and passion with social justice. And um, by giving op open-ended type projects, they um, are able to express themselves. And, and that's wonderful. Um, Another, so this is, you'll see the vast difference in, in students here. We had a student develop a coding project. Um, hopefully this one will load. Um, so this student decided, um, really was inspired by um, the quote, one lives not for oneself, but for one's community. And so he actually um, went ahead and, and coded um, Let's see if, it, if this will go through. Um, if you, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, and so what he, what he had done is that he actually was quantifying how many first responders were being born. So he viewed um, living for one's community as serving. And so it was so neat. He went through and coded um, this, did an amazing job um, and used statistical analysis and did, did such a, an amazing, amazing work. Um, just, but that shows that see the, the, you know, different learning styles. And so he was definitely met more mathematical. And um, here's a, another student here um, who um, did some art. This one will go here. RBG said, one lives not for oneself, but for one's community. I drew this picture of RBG with her quote in the background. In my project, I looked at ways that her quote is shown through music. Music is a form of art, so I made my own art to go with it. And this student um, made an extensive presentation um, with different songs and lyrics that she felt um, really represented this, this quote, along with her, her art here, which is beautiful. Um, we'll see another student used, used a 3D printer um, and created this um, absolutely amazing um, piece of art. Um, and so he used a 3D printer, but in, it's because of the fact there's two different colors of filament and the everything with this, it was, it was quite a, a, a really nice project. Um, that he um, completed, and that takes a lot of lot of work. So I was very proud of him. Um, 
we have another one here. Okay, this one we have loaded. Okay, so here we go. Supreme Court would never worsen, which is a very famous and loved person. She goes by the name of Barb BG, and all the time she makes people smile with glee. She made a quote, and what it means to me is that your life is like planting an apple tree. You plant the seed and watch it grow, taking care of it as you go. And then when it's time and the tree has grown, you pass away and turn to bone. Then as you float along your boat, you watch as people come. They all come together and gather around the tree, picking apples while listening to the buzz of the bees. What I mean is that you leave some green where there was none before, you pave the path for others to follow, and from yourself you let others borrow. All right, and one more real quick project. Um, this student, let's see if this will allow. Yes, okay. This student did all original art um, and it is absolutely incredible. She has decided that she um, wants to pursue art. All of this is her original her original art, including the backgrounds. And what she, her goal is, is to use Journey to create an entire art portfolio. Um, and she's really wanting to create her brand um, and pursue like her learning through developing her, her art. And um, really her, it, it, it just really was incredible. Um, you could tell she had truly embraced um, what her learning and that was um, it was very meaningful to her and it was amazing what she developed um, we also worked on a family history project to start off our year where we the students were um, did research with um, and learned about primary and secondary sources and they incorporated them they're learning with history and so they had again some choice in what part of history um, they were going to explore based on the interviews they conducted with family members. Um, so I wanted them truly to connect their, their, I guess the truth about like history that it's, it's about people. And um, this is an excerpt of somebody's in our class who did an amazing job. My family story. My granddad was born in England, but his father was Welsh. World War II impacted England's economy a lot and left many English families very poor. My granddad's dad died and no one was able to tell him, so he had to find out on his own. Because of this death, money in the family became even more scarce. Many people left school young to try to get a job and work for their family's money, migrated among them. Since his dad died, that created an even worse economic issue for their family. 56 years ago on August 24th, my granddad got his first job as a junior bank clerk. Not having much money made my granddad a very hard worker and very dedicated. He only had four jobs in his entire life, two of them being a computer consultant. He then had my mom, aunts, and uncle. My mom is currently the only married sibling. And just for the sake of time, um, this is an incredible presentation um, that she goes on then to talk. I explained about my family. I'm going to go more into how World War II impacted England. According to CNN Travel, all of the intricate carvings on Big Ben were destroyed due to World War II. Many cities were destroyed by the Nazis in World War II. London was bombed for 57 consecutive nights and many other places were bombed as well. World War II left lots of damage and a poor economy. My granddad lived in a community home, left school early, and lots of people had no money. As History Today put it, in 1950, the legacy of the Second World War was still everywhere to be seen. Britain gradually recovered from its economic issues and started to fit itself as a country and grow. I didn't elaborate on the recovery as it was not in the time period I chose to research. 
Throughout this project, I learned many new things. Before this, I had no idea how much my granddad had suffered through the war, anything about his financial stability, or that World War II impacted England so much. Thank you. So you can just see the personal connections that the students were able to make through this, through this project. Um, and really that it, it made um, a lot of just connection with history for these students. And Mr. Theodore, would you um, like to talk about the, um, some of the literature connections? Sure. So for the sake of time, we won't, uh, we don't have to um, click on all of them, but I will just mention a couple of things generally that um, the novel, The Outsiders, uh, was chosen to start the year for, for many reasons. Again, uh, it ties perfectly in with the culture and community and identity theme um, in this book. We had a number of mini projects that we did throughout the year, uh, throughout these last couple months. Uh, you can see um, incorporating reading and writing, uh, writing from a uh, writing a scene of the from the novel from a different character's perspective, a different point of view was one um, small activity that we did. Again, um, the the novel does deal with uh, issues of grief and the way that certain characters uh, and the way that human beings in general process grief and the way we we go the different stages of grief and. Uh, had them actually write a, uh, an obituary for one of the characters in the novel of their choice, and then to explore the idea of symbolism and uh, deeper meaning of certain quotes and texts. Um, there was a time when I had them write, uh, create tattoos for a character and talk about what kind of symbols and what kind of sayings would be placed uh, on a character. So really diving into the deeper meaning there of, of uh, the text. If we go back to slide 13, uh, we can just listen um, okay. to that. You got it there? Um, this one's the outsiders. There we go. Some of our student reactions. In the Outsiders, the theme of stereotyping is shown. We see this theme all throughout the story with both the socias and the greasers, and is shown all the time when the greasers are considered scandals, just because they look like rascals. The socias are always thought to be having a good time because they're rich, which is not true. This made me realize that many people in real life uh, are often misjudged only based on appearance or only through shallow interactions. In the Outsiders, theme of emotional suppression is shown. We see this when Randy opens up to Pony Boy about how he feels about Bob's death. This made me realize that I'm a very sensitive person and that nobody really knows about my mental state. In The Outsiders, the theme of economic division is shown. We see this occurring between the socias and greasers. They are separated into rivalry gangs and are stereotyped because of the amount of money they have. This leads to violence. We see this from Pony Boy, a character in the novel, stereotypes someone because they were wealthy. This made me realize that people are separated, judged, and stereotyped due to their financial state. In The Outsiders, the theme of violence is shown. We see this when Pony Boy gets jumped by the socials. This made me realize that people fight for others because of their beliefs and for each other. In The Outsiders, the theme of loyalty is shown. We see this when all the greasers stick up for each other no matter what happens. The book impacted my life in a major way. It made me realize not to judge a person by their outside appearance. In The Outsiders, the theme of connection is shown. We see this when Dally goes to save Johnny to save the brotherhood between the two. This made me take a big step into reconnecting with someone whom I needed as a friend. I believed in the big power of connection within two people, which helped me make a bond between two or more people. In the outsiders, the theme economic divisions is shown. The socials may have more money, but that doesn't necessarily mean their life is perfect, like the greasers assume. It made me realize that I am rich, not necessarily in money, but by the valuable friendships I have with friends and family. So really enjoyed seeing their 
reactions to the book and how it applied to their life, seeing those big themes, those big issues of uh, stereotypes, again, of economic division. Um, and one of the final projects there for pulling it all together uh, was a website where they were able to compile all of their, um, the different thematic elements, the different elements of fiction, um, but then again, have a place where integrating that technology that they could um, uh, showcase their, their deeper understanding of the text. And um, from both of our, our classes, we do keep individual digital portfolios for the students so that they will have, they'll be able to do reflecting and uh, again, that continued goal setting. some of these again and all right and as you've seen too um again we have these our digital student portfolios and you can see some of the just amazing things that we have here at journey we have vr a vr system the kids are really excited about developing some content um, vr content we have um, 3d printers um, a green screen with um, just um, amazing opportunities for the kids and full podcasting equipment. And we're just so excited about all the things that we get, we're going to be doing with the kids. Yep. And here's just another look at the program highlights again, all of our fun technology that we feel so fortunate uh, to have. I'm currently presenting from one of these super smart boards that's touch screen and uh, very interactive 3d printers the headsets the podcasting all of that um, but not only just the stuff it's not just the the things the gadgets uh, it's the people you know we really try hard um, to to provide that rigorous nurturing environment for for all students that come through the doors whether they're learning at home or we're learning at school um, we have these smaller class sizes, which is such, such a blessing really to, um, to be able to, to reach those students individually and to create these learning plans for them that are based on their strengths. Uh, we do have some software that we're testing this year called, uh, well not, no, we're, we have a trial of it, Renzuli, which we've been uh, really trying to use and adapt. Um, we plan on bringing in a lot of uh, guest speakers into our classes and having authentic audiences. So people in the fields that they're learning about can come and present and can come and, and speak to them. And of course, as Mr. Clancy said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we are situated here in a, in a beautiful campus with lots of um, common areas, common spaces. I personally love taking my lunch out to the courtyard there at the tables. And it's a wonderful place to live, learn, and grow. Uh, as Mr. Theodoro mentioned, it you know it is more than the staff; it's the people. And I have to say, this is my first year here at Mountain Trail. And there are so many just warm, caring, wonderful teachers here, and it is a gorgeous campus. And so it's just a been a very positive experience here. Um, so uh, here's some pictures of our, our campus, and uh, as Mr. Theodoro also mentioned, that uh, we've vast outdoor spaces. Um, this is the back end of our campus. Um, but um, along with that, we have extensive resources. Um, this is not limited to this, but we, um, as you can see, um, we just have so many resources at our fingertips um, to use with the kids. And it's been fantastic so far. And it's gonna get even better. <laughs> We do follow um, a block schedule here, um, well, a block slash period schedule at Mountain Trails. ELA and math are 75 minutes each. And then you've got uh, social studies and science for, is that? A total of 90 minutes. A total of 90 minutes, okay, there we go. Um, we have lunch, uh, we have clubs during lunch there. Um, people can come in. Um, I think it's the counseling department that runs a lot of these. Uh, National Junior Honor Society is a big one and something that I think a lot of our gifted students uh, strive to, but students with common interests can come together and, and meet and collaborate and share their passion for, for various different clubs and or various different extracurricular activities. 
And it's been wonderful that block scheduling really lets, um, um, especially in you know, our math and ELA, um, just that gives that time um, that is, is so nice to have, but it's not rushed then. Um, and that's been really, really wonderful. And also in the situation that we are in with, with um, our, you know, the reality of COVID and needing to socially distance, it's, it's very nice to be on these block schedules because we have such um, a lot fewer kids rotating at the same time because a block schedule and times as you notice and the class period and times are at different and are and and at different times so we do not have much crowding in the hallways and it's been really really nice um, some of the clubs too uh, it's these are all uh, teachers who are all going um, volunteering their time because they love kids um, and just really wanting kids to be able to make friends and meet each other. So in addition to the core subjects that we provide in the journey program, students do have the opportunity to step out of their um, the journey cohort and participate in lots of different uh, fun electives. You can see them up here on the board. Uh, again, we have language and we have um, uh, a variety of things to create a well-rounded education for all students. Um, things, of course, have been changed a little bit because of COVID and with supplies and, of course, PE and some of these may look a little different um, during the pandemic, uh, but we are still, we've got um, many, many wonderful people that, uh, teachers that we also look forward to in the journey program to collaborating with in the future, um, perhaps on different project-based learning activities. Lots of technology here at, at Mountain Trail um, with computer science classes and um, we're making a digital magazine in my digital media class, um, amazing drama teacher. Um, the kids just are very excited about what they're um, learning here. Our environmental adventures teacher does some amazing things with the, the kids as well. So it's just, it's lots of fun. So many amazing electives for the kids um, are available. So this might be one that a lot of um, parents are looking at. So you heard about the program, you're hearing about it. How do I apply? What is the uh, criteria for acceptance? Um, this is what the gifted department is looking for a 97 percentile in any of the two areas uh verbal quantitative or nonverbal. uh parents at home maybe you might want to this will be i know on facebook so it's it's being recorded but you might even want to take a picture of this slide if you want to refer back to it um you have the gifted qualification at 97 percent in one area and 90 percent in one area plus a principal recommendation so it would be a good idea to um to start you know, planning that in your mind about uh, who you need to ask. An IQ of 130 or higher. And of course, we do look for uh, high performance on our most current easy merit reading and math uh, assessments. So last year, we know that they were canceled, but uh, we will, whatever that most recent one will be, whether it's this year or two years ago, that's the one we'll be going with. All right, and in order to apply, you would, um, all the applications are live on the gifted department's website. Um, and we'd like to end with this quote here. So it is good to have an end to, to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. And really, thank you for tuning in. And I think we'll, sounds like we're going to have some time for, for questions here, but we really uh, appreciate everybody tuning in and giving up part of their evening. It's uh, our honor and joy to, um, to have our current students and we look forward to continuing to grow the program and accepting even more and more of our Paradise Valley learners, gifted learners in the years to come. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for all that wonderful information and sharing the amazing projects these students are doing. I love seeing the variety and the different artwork. Um, 
uh, it's, you know, really surprising, especially because you've only been um, had uh, actually I don't even have you had eighth graders even arrive Have they been there for two days. Two I, days. Yes, two days. And it's so, I mean, to think about <clears throat> that they did all that work really away from the building for the majority of that time. Uh, the blend the did, did, aspect of our program really has made that um, the transition pretty pretty easy. Like the kids, the kids were able to do a lot of things on, online. So, well, we do have some questions coming in, but I would like to ask anyone watching uh, the video on Zoom if you have any questions please post them in the chat area and I will ask them for you. We do have your mics off and that was not to exclude you. It was, as we all know, if you've been on so many of these Zoom conversations or webinars, et cetera, that there are accidental mic um, openings where we end up hearing the dogs or kids or something else. So that's why we, uh, we have you off with your mics. I do have a question whether or not you are going to allow observations. So can kids come through for a tour? And I'm not sure you even have an answer to that. Um, I, I know last week at the um, DLC, the, the answer was no, but I think that the worst. Not still, yet. Yeah, uh, we're still, we can look into that. Mr. Clancy? <laughs> Uh, we are making preparations to start touring families in safe ways and in small groups in the coming weeks. Our plan is to post a uh, link to our main web page that will allow, that will have dates uh, that were available for tours. Uh, my hope is to give all of those tours personally. Uh, obviously, we will be limited in the number of people that we can bring, spacing out, wearing masks, uh, but with kids on campus now, it does open the opportunity to start getting people on campus who are interested in learning more about Journey uh, and, uh, and, and the school in general. Well, and, and that's a great point because, because schools have just started in person, I know a lot of parents were concerned about testing because many of the school feeder schools for Mountain Trails did not get their spring testing. Can you, can one of you talk a little bit about that? Um, Do you, Elizabeth, are you able to jump on if they, I may yes. have caught her off here. <laughs> no, we are, are making arrangements for testing. We'll be starting um, with those schools that we were not able to finish in the spring. They will be first on the fall list. But um, again, we're still working on those arrangements making sure that it's safe to, to do so. Okay, and we did just get a question in here. Uh, I did not see this on your slide. When do applications open for submission? They're live already. Okay. They're now, uh, go ahead. So Elizabeth, are they live for the, the families that live in the feeder schools, or are they live for anyone in Paradise Valley at this time? I do believe that they're open for the feeder first, and then um, 1st of November is open for all Paradise Valley and out of district. So, so again, just to explain for, for parents that are not used to the way that the middle school and high school applications typically go for these specialty programs, Initially, students that live, actually live in the feeder school system. So if you attend one of the schools that feeds directly to mountain trails, or if you have had a student attending one of the schools that feeds to mountain trails, then you are considered in that feeder system and can apply in October if you are outside of those schools, you can put your application in in November, and the applications that are in in October will be reviewed in November. Those that are submitted in November are reviewed in December, and after that, they're open for all applications. Is that correct, Elizabeth? That is true. Okay. Um, we've got, if your sixth grader is at a ninth grade math and or reading level, how do you offer math classes for him or her? 
I can take that one. The math uh, portion is outside of the journey program. So they would um, go to wherever they need to go for their math class, whether it's algebra or uh, pre-algebra or geometry or wherever that, that might be. I, we, I know we do have a current student who is um, taking geometry at Pinnacle. Now, Melissa, the, uh, the, the quick answer to that is that, that dependent upon the number of students who qualify in the school for geometry, uh, there are years where we offer geometry here on our campus. We have two teachers who are interested and qualified, actually three, who are interested and qualified to teach geometry and have taught geometry in the past. Uh, and if we don't have enough kids to, uh, to create a section of just Mount Trail kids, uh, they can go, and, and we have three students right now who attend geometry at Pinnacle High School during their first hour. They make it back to Mount Trail uh, prior to, uh, to period one starting here because we're a late start. We start at 9 a.m. Understood. And uh, so this next question, I'm laughing just because I sat through the entire board meeting. Um, how do you know if your child is in a feeder school? We live in Sky Crossing, but currently are enrolled at Wildfire. So I'm going to let one of you answer that because I sat through the board meeting. Well, I'll, I'll take that as, as I sat through the board meeting as well. And I was on the boundary committee that just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. So uh, currently um, there is a portion of Sky Cross. This is for the 2021 school year. There is a portion of Sky Crossing that is boundary to Mountain Trail and a portion of Sky Crossing that is boundary to Explore. Uh, moving into the 21-22 school year, so for next year, all of Sky Crossing will be or will be boundary to Mountain Trail. So busing is provided uh, from all of Sky Crossing to Mountain Trail, and we are actually a homeschool. Uh, however, because of the uh, because of the the scenario and some of the confusion and the split, uh, there will be a a variance opportunity for the students in Sky Crossing uh, to attend Explore. Also, uh, busing is not included. Uh, but they are guaranteed a spot at Explorer. Uh, so we are the homeschool, uh, but Explorer can also be an option kind of as a, as if homeschool for now, it just doesn't include busing. But if you're looking to attend the journey, you are now in your homeschool feeder school or feeder location, I guess, your house. <laughs> All right, well, one of the other questions, well, we got another one here. Um, oh. So if um, we've already talked a little bit about the math um, and then what types of languages are offered? Uh, it, you, you noted that there were languages, but what languages are offered? So we have Span Sp Spanish one uh, and, and Spanish two uh, it would set the students up for an opportunity to enter uh, in high school at uh, Spanish three, four. We also have Mandarin. Uh, since we have this slide back up, though, one of the things that I'd like to say is, is Janine hit it on the head. We have a ton of STEM, uh, STEMI, STEMish uh, elective opportunities. One that's not on there, two actually that aren't on there that we will offer for next year. Uh, I have already secured uh, a commitment from our CTE in the district uh, and, uh, and funding for the opportunity to add engineering. Uh, for next year, as well as the uh, being the only middle school in PV that offers biomedical engineering uh, through a semester elective called medical detectives, uh, which we're very, very excited about both of those. And do you offer any advanced art level classes on campus for your middle school students? We do, we do, yeah, we have intro to art and, and if they're successful in that, then they can progress on to advanced art. Uh, although through uh, submission of some material, they can qualify for advanced art uh, as seventh graders. Well, and it certainly looks like in the journey program itself, you have the ability to use those art skills at a very high level if you want to. So that's a nice opportunity uh, outside the art class to be able to integrate that, which is the idea of the program. Uh, so I know this hasn't been asked, but I'm going to throw it in there um, because I've got kid, a, a kid, well, two kids, I guess, that have gone through the Digital Learning Center. And of course, this is the, the new program. 
um, what are some of the key differences between the Digital Learning Center and the Journey? Um, well, I guess I will start and then maybe Ms. Franson can, can pick it up. I guess uh, one of the best ways to think about it would be perhaps a Venn diagram is looking at uh, similarities and differences. I think some similarities are that we are both, uh, we both definitely um, try to integrate and provide a holistic curriculum as much as possible. Well, that's definitely similar looking at thematic units and overlapping bringing in things uh, that concept level instruction um, interdisciplinary approach i would say a definite another technology another similarity is the use of technology and, and integration um, perhaps even you know so, some components of blended learning there i think technology is certainly infused throughout both uh, wonderful staff members, I'm sure, experienced uh, instructors, if I may say so, of, at both places. I think the, the big difference that I think where we're going is to provide that maybe individualized plan for each student to navigate their, as the name implies, journey to kind of uh, map out and their own course. Of course, there's um, choice involved at, at you know, the DLC and, you know, because that's just good teaching, right? That's just good pedagogy is to allow the students to have certain autonomy. But when, as we, as we develop the program and go through it, I see us more and more being able to really um, develop that uh, self-advocacy that we talked about earlier and that approach to learning that is very, very personalized and able to, um, you know, to kind of sit with the teachers in a personal way to, to chart that out is something that we aspire to. You can feel free to, if I missed anything there, Ms. Franson. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I agree. The individualization um, aspect is, is definitely um, part, part of what, what possibly would make us unique. Um, I know that both, I, I, I just know that that both programs are, you know, of course, good teaching is just you're you're going to identify the needs of your students, and I know that will happen at, at both programs. And I'm just so um, impressed with in Paradise Valley this that you know we they we saw the need that there was a waiting list. There is a waiting list. Um, there there has been for many years at DLC and um, we've expanded, and it's very exciting that we um, as a gifted department have developed another program here and our, you know, the, the, the middle school teachers are working together to meet the needs of all of our district students. Absolutely. It's, and it's, if, if I've got an eighth grader or soon to be eighth grader, can they apply to go in as an eighth grader? Or do you have to start as a seventh grader? That's an excellent question. They, yes, they can apply. Um, yeah. And we're actually still accepting that we have a few spaces even for this year. So if a student is an eighth grader, either at Mountain Trails or another middle school, they can apply and jump over? We'll take them. Great. <laughs> okay. And so I know that oftentimes in middle school, there are competitions that are um, applied to from either programs uh, either the classroom programs have the students compete and then there are outside things like robotics and stuff but I do know that especially like at the DLC I know we've had kids apply to is it the national history I can't remember the name of them but are those things that you're doing there as well yeah, and we're exploring all of all of our options since we do have you know our, our new program um, and just um, Kind of, we're we're building, <laughs> and so there's sure. so many opportunities out there for our students, and um, it's it's really exciting. So. I think for language arts, there's lots of things that we can do. Um, the word masters competition that's something we can continue we do have um this isn't necessarily specific to journey but of course we have our we have our spelling bees and we have different um you know competitions at that school level um but sure. as Ms. Francis said it is certainly something um that we want to kind of uh carve out and find those um initiatives for our kids to be a part of as well 
Well, I just want to make sure if anyone watching this presentation has any additional questions, please just jump onto your chat and put those in there. Um, we have had a few questions from our Facebook. We still have about 30 people watching, uh, which is incredible after this length of time. So I appreciate your hanging in there and giving us, you know, your time to, to share all the different unique elements of this program. Uh, it's really wonderful to see it. We do know that PV has had a waiting list for several years for the middle school program, and it's been something they've been trying to do. Of course, who thought we would be opening it in the middle of a pandemic? Um, you know, so, but based on the work of those students, they have not missed a beat and neither have you guys. So congratulations on a great first quarter. Uh, that's some amazing production from students that you have not been in a classroom with. Um, looks like we've got somebody that says they are looking forward for their daughter to apply. So congratulations to that. Thank you. Um, uh, really, if it, is there anything, Patrick, that you think was missed or any other questions, comments you guys would like to make? You know, Melissa, I think the, the only other thing that I would add that I know Janine and Ted wouldn't is um, <laughs> uh, that, that I think that all of us who have been in education for a long time and parents who have, have watched their kids uh, progress from one grade level to another know that to, um, you know, to some degree and, and perhaps to a large degree, the experience that the kids are going to have in any given school year is going to be dependent upon the adults that they spend the majority of their time with. And uh, just like any industry in, in education, uh, there are teachers who are just phenomenal uh, and, and know how to support and get the best out of kids. Um, and, and then there are, are some experiences that are, are more average and, and even below average. Um, Ted and Janine wouldn't say it, uh, but I think you probably picked up on it as you were watching uh, them, them work through the presentation tonight. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful human beings that just flat out love kids. And uh, they are workhorses. They're so creative uh, and, and intellectually engaging and patient and flexible. Um, these kids are getting an amazing experience with them and, and truly it's because of them uh, in the entirety. Uh, they, have, they have created a wonderful uh, learning environment and a wonderful uh, learning opportunities for their kids. Um, they would, whoever comes to Journey, for all of those families and students who are interested, uh, they're going to have an amazing experience that they'll never forget. Well, and I think it's really important to, you know, thank you guys for bringing your expertise and your uniqueness to this program because you guys really do come with some amazing skills. And um, it's obvious by what you've already seen the students do. Um, we do have a couple more questions that just came in. One is how large, what, what are the class sizes? How large are those class sizes? Um, we're capped at 25, just like this. It's the same as the DLC. What are they this year, Janine? Currently 18 and one, and is it 12? Wow. We had a student start right. from across the country, actually, which was amazing, and moved here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, this is what happens when you open during a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, but we, again, we do still have some openings, and um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. The kids are just amazing. So so let me clarify, it's 25 per grade level. And right now you do have some of the kids, uh, you, they are crossing over. You do have some seventh graders in the eighth grade and some eighth graders in the seventh grade classrooms. Is that correct? It is multi-age. Multi-age, yes. And we have, so okay. we have two groups of 25 because there's the two teachers. So 50 total. Right. <laughs> right, 50 total. Um, and so uh, the other thing is, uh, are there honors classes outside of the journey classes? I think the only classes they take outside of the journey are electives and math. Is that correct? No, math. Okay. Teacher. So, right. So to try and help, if, if to try and help a parent understand middle schools typically don't have honors classes other than Desert Shadows Middle School, which has a whole honors program. So 
So in the case of either the Digital Learning Center or Journey, the four classes are taught by the either two or three teachers. And so the programs you would think that would have an honors label would not be um, taught uh, at, at either uh, Mid Mountain Trails or, or Sunrise for those students. And I'm being corrected. So all middle schools have honors program right now, but the kids in this program wouldn't be taking them, correct? Yeah, Melissa, so uh, dependent upon the middle school and we have the, the seven traditional middle schools in PV plus uh, the K-8 school at Pinnacle Peak. Uh, all of them will offer some kind of an honors at minimum a uh, leveled math that has the opportunity for, for geometry or algebra, uh, sure. advanced math for sure. Uh, not necessarily called honors, but, um, but certainly accelerated. Uh, all of our middle schools will have honors English, uh, some in a block and, and some in a single period. Uh, some of the middle schools, but not all, will offer a honors science and an honors social studies option uh, specific to journey. Um, all of the cores, the, with the exception of math, are covered in Journey. So those are our, our gifted science, gifted social studies, gifted ELA through Journey, and then the leveled math, whatever math is the most appropriate, whether that be uh, geometry or algebra or, or pre-algebra, dependent upon the grade level. Awesome. And thank you so much for that clarification. And thank you, uh, Rebecca, as well. And Go ahead. Um, just one thing to note, um, just the way with our the way that our schedule worked out, a lot of our journey students are do did end up being together for their math. Um, it's not necessarily specific to the program, but it's just the way the schedule works. So a lot of the kids are are together in a lot of their math classes. Sure. So really important. Could you go to the last slide? I believe it should show the. Um, the gifted website, if it does not, um, oops, the, if, if it doesn't, uh, it's pvschools.net slash gifted, and then you can go to the middle school tab to get to the application itself under uh, Mountain Trails Middle School. It'll say journey is what it'll say, and then the application is there. Uh, and you can reach me if you have any questions as a parent, um, you can reach me at gifted at pvupc.org. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for adding the pvschools.net slash gifted. And again, under there, you can look under middle schools, you will see journey. And I believe that's where the application is. So without any other questions, we really appreciate your taking all this time this evening. Uh, Ted, I know you have a little one at home, so thank you. And, and Janine, yours are bigger than mine, I think. So, um, But thank you very much this evening for sharing what a wonderful new program PV Schools has added to its middle school uh, curriculum that we have available for students and for parents, because we know the parents are very involved in trying to get that education for their students. So thank you. Thank you guys very much. I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to disconnect our